on um, technology and then the Syria revolution, the Syrian crisis. Syria, I mean, there's so many negative words you could use for that. And in many ways, this is, this is I've been looking forward to this one the most because the work being done by the sect group in particular is, um, is actually just absolutely fascinating some stuff they're doing. And a lot of it takes place kind of behind the radar because they provide services to different groups. But it's going to be, I think, really fascinating to hear about what they're doing as an operational think tank. I'm going to ask my colleague Megan to come up and introduce the speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to introduce two members from the SecDev group. Anwar Abbas uh, works as the Syria subject matter expert on SecDev's ongoing digital security and monitoring projects. Anwar achieved a master's in science at the University of East London, after which he spent several years working on both, in both domestic and international NGOs in Damascus, including the British Council and the International Labour Organization. As part of the SecDev Syria Operations Group, Anwar monitors and analyzes open sources on, on the internet to collect up-to-date news on the conflict and focuses in particular on communications in Syria. Anwar leads SecDev's outreach strategy with contacts in-country to disseminate information about safe communications and to gain on-the-ground knowledge about digital and conflict events. Micah Clark is a specialist projects analyst at the SecDev Group. Prior to working at SECTA, Micah was an associate at Public History Incorporated, a professional historical research firm where he managed and executed research projects for law firms, corporations, and government uh, departments. Micah has a master's degree in international affairs from the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University, with a special emphasis on counterterrorism and national security law. Micah's work at SECTA focuses on social media and uh, social media network analysis in conflict zones in the Middle East, including Syria. Please join me in welcoming both Anwar and Micah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this has been a really exciting opportunity for us. Anwar and I were just reflecting several months ago on the anniversary of the second, uh, second anniversary of the Syrian revolution that we personally wanted an opportunity to reflect a bit on what it all meant. Uh, our work is often incredibly tactical. We don't have the opportunity to step back from it uh, often enough, frankly. So this is, presents an off, awesome opportunity for us to do that um, in the context of atrocity prevention. Um, as Megan mentioned, we both work in the Syria Operations Group. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary group. We do a lot of different work. Uh, Anwar are and I are experts and analysts, so we're basically paid to disagree. So if, uh, if at any point we go, hey, no, hold on a second, that's um, to be expected, uh, because that's the nature of uh, working in an analytical group. Uh, let's see, what else to cover off the top? It's going to be a bit of a jockey show. We're going to be bouncing back and forth between the two of us. Uh, we'll be covering a number of case studies, and we'll get into that. Um, but I'll lead off in explaining basically how we uh, understand the challenge uh, in the work that we do, the opportunities that, that uh, the conflict presents, and the, the dynamics of the conflict technologically, how those, those uh, those work in our advantage, and then what are our responses? So to begin with, the challenge. Um, there are a number of challenges involved here, primarily from an outside perspective. Uh, assistance to the Syrian people requires information. That's the, the baseline requirement. Uh, it's very, very dangerous to try and provide assistance to anyone without full information uh, on the situation that you're dealing with. Um, and the absolute absence of traditional media in Syria, or not absolute, but largely um, extensive absence of traditional media, means that turning to other sources is extremely valuable. Uh, Colette, Colette mentioned the fog of war, which is of course very, very accurate in this context. Um, another challenge is that, uh, maybe, maybe it's just one challenge. Another challenge is that the weapon is used as a weapon, or the, the internet is used as a weapon of war in Syria by both sides of the conflict. Uh, this image is from the Syrian conflict and the, the Arabic reads Islah al Jadid. It's the new weapon, and you can see a USB stick going into, uh, appears to be an M16. Um, it's used for messaging, it's used for counter messaging by both sides, it's used for coordination by both sides. In fact, the regime uses uh, social media and the internet for its own coordination, and of course it's used for situational awareness both by us and by Syrians themselves, which is the third challenge. Uh, the internet is an essential lifeline for ordinary Syrians. 
day-to-day, uh, -day, even moment-to-moment information is provided on the internet. Coordination and communication is critical for them. Um, and because it's so essential to survive, many Syrians put themselves at risk on the internet. Um, that's a big part of what we do, is helping them to avoid that risk. So, in that light, the opportunity that the internet provides in the Syrian conflict, I'd like to give a few uh, numbers to, to begin with in a larger global context. I was quite struck yesterday uh, when uh, General Delaire used the, the, the concept of tools to coalesce, which is a fantastic way to describe social media. It is an opportunity and a tool that is used by groups to coalesce. Um, there are approximately 2.5 billion internet users in the world. Uh, there are 6 billion cell phones in the world. And two-thirds of all the people who use the internet and cell phones are under the age of 25 years old. That is an extraordinary community of people that we need to tap into. Uh, I'd like to invite Anwar as well to, to speak briefly about how that implements and how that enacts itself specifically for the Syrian people as a Syrian himself. Um, all day I look at my uh, Facebook every five minutes just to find out what is happening in my neighborhood and whether my mother's house has been hit. You know, this is how essential the internet is to every Syrian. Um, the conflict in Syria is covered by traditional media from one perspective, <coughs> the regime, the control national media. Uh, foreign media is banned in Syria. I mean, recently, in the past two months, Al Arabiya, Al Jazeera, and uh, Sky News Arabia made it to Syria and they reported from the north. I come from the south, from Damascus, where there is only regime controlled media. The only way to get the information is the internet. Uh, this is how important it is. I communicate with my mother, nephews, nieces, sisters, friends through Facebook, Skype. We don't even use phone anymore because it's monitored by the regime and you know it's much easier to monitor telephones than uh, the internet because we use VPNs, etc. Uh, in Syria now about 50% of the country is disconnected, has no internet uh, as a result of the conflict, if not 60%. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. However, the number of Facebook users in Syria is estimated by the Dubai School of Governance at about 5 to 6 million. Syria has a population of 23 million. So this is a huge number. Uh, the number of cell phone users in Syria tripled between 2011 and, and now. Although, I mean, most of the country, like the huge part of the country, is disconnected because <coughs> of the damage infrastructure. Uh, this is how important it is. Um, so, um, again, to drive home the sort of essential value of, of social media there, um, we did, as, as Anwar said, the, the steady increase in cell phone use is a remarkable statistic given that conflict has intensified over that period. Um, and through 2012, the number of Syrians online and on Facebook was also steadily increasing in the face of the conflict uh, and in the face of reduced connectivity. We're now seeing that beginning to decline as infrastructure degrades substantially and, and the simple ha ability to, to gain access is reduced, though we'll come back to that as well and discuss it at some length. Um, for us, as uh, individuals who collected an enormous amount of information, process it, analyze it, to, to understand what it means both for our own work and for the work of our partners, um, social media creates a, a very rich, textured, and unmediated source of information. Uh, we were discussing yesterday uh, with Alan's talk about the media as a, as a mediator. Um, social media provides a remarkable, unmediated source. We have very special um, sort of approaches to that in order to deal with that. Um, but ensuring the integrity and the security of that access is a constant challenge for Syrians and for us. Uh, and probably the most important is helping to understand how we separate signal from noise in that context. There is an enormous amount of traffic uh, in Syria and around the world. In order to, for us to implement solutions, we need to separate signal from noise and understand what's actually happening rather than understanding all of the other nonsense that also comes through internet channels. Um, that challenge can be quite terrifying on some level, um, but we've developed a number of analytical approaches that simplify that and uh, find great efficiencies there. 
And finally, I think it's important to know, and I think this is the big takeaway for the entire presentation, is that Siri is the new ordinary. Um, the level of digitization, the level of connection, the level of interdependence of uh, communications is the new ordinary in a conflict setting. Um, there's no reason to think otherwise. In that context, there are certain realities of this new ordinary. Um, first off is communications power. That's always been true. I mean, this, is, this goes back to Thucydides or Clausewitz or whoever you want to pick. Being able to communicate in the conflict is an absolute essential piece. Uh, again, it's a weapon of war. Secondly, this is an important concept to, to understand fully. Vulnerability online is vulnerability offline uh, for Syrians. If you are leaving yourself exposed online, you are effectively leaving yourself exposed offline. Um, the picture of the gentleman running across the street with his groceries is a perfect example on the previous page um, of the sort of vulnerability that occurs both online and offline. Um, communicating your message online without uh, sufficient regard for your own security is a bit like running across the street when a sniper shoots. Uh, and finally, uh, two other points relating to analytics. First off, it's about fusion in terms of the way we approach it. Um, we're very techno technologically led, um, but we're also very, very richly um, informed by traditions of analysis and intelligence and research. Um, so for us, seeing social media signal isn't enough. Um, if it's going to be valuable both to us and to our clients, it has to be uh, validated and it has to be fused, both from a technical and analytical perspective, those two things have to come together very closely, but also from the various, if you want to call them ints, so human intelligence, open source intelligence from other sources like news media, and what this new concept that we've developed and that's been developed in academia called SOCOMINT, social media intelligence. So, our response to the situation in Syria uh, is composed of a number of different pillars. First off, we help to in, uh, ensure integrity and security of communications, and Anwar is going to describe in some detail uh, various tools and services that we provide to do that. Um, we also have um, fused technology and analysis. The set this active group itself is made up of analysts who sit in rooms and think, uh, and cyber developers who sit in rooms and type uh, and develop new tools, new solutions for us, but also for the people that we help. And finally, and this is a point that I, I will dwell on for a moment or two, um, it's important to understand the work that SecDev does not as what you might consider intelligence in the sort of classic and pejorative sense. This is not 007. Um, this is not even security intelligence in, in the sense that you might think of, you know, Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Um, and this most certainly is not PRISM, this, this new thing that you're hearing about out of the United States. Um, I think the, the, the closer corollary, in particular the sincere UN folks here, is probably the Joint Missions Analysis Center concept for the UN. Um, the UN recognized as early as 1996, uh, Kofi Annan said, that we've learned contrary to past hesitations that intelligence is necessary and that we need to have a solid political analysis to be able to, if not determine, then envision how a crisis is likely to develop and how we would act if, one, if it went in one direction or another. Um, the notion that you can somehow react without intelligence, that is, information with intent um, is rather naive. Um, one of the main problems, and I think one of the main hesitations that people often have with this concept of intelligence is that they don't necessarily understand the process the, that, it, that's, that it entails. Um, they have certain preconceptions about it. Um, actually, a, an assessment of the, the JMAC concept, uh, gentleman, or a lady sorry, named uh, Melanie Rangeway, uh, made this point. She effectively said that, you know, to this day, much of the ambivalence surrounding UN intelligence capabilities stems from the misconception that intelligence is necessarily the result of a covert process. And it's critically important for us to emphasize that the work that we do is all in the public domain. It is not a covert process. Um, the approaches that we take may not be the sort of thing that we're going to sing from the rooftops, but the process itself and the information inputs to it are absolutely uh, in the open domain. So, Anwar is going to describe a bit of the situation in Syria from the perspective of an information war. Um, there is a conflict in Syria on the ground. There is another one that is taking place in virtual space. This is uh, reality.
from uh, day one of the conflict. Almost everything that happens in Syria is being captured one way or another on camera and posted on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Uh, the picture on uh, the bottom right is uh, a screenshot from a video of the first victim that was killed by regime forces in Daraa on the 17th of March. That is two days into the revolution, 2011. That was captured by someone who was actually filming the demonstration and posted on YouTube. Within an hour, it made its way to Al Jazeera, Arabia, BBC, Arabic, and several regional satellite uh, TV networks. The other picture is one of a demonstration that uh, took place on a, a, a Friday in Hama, and that became a tradition for several months. We would gather there to um, demonstrate against the regime. That was in July 2007. A few days later, the regime invaded Hama with tanks, and everything changed ever since. Um, so. Things were happening, almost everyone in Syria, or a large majority of people turned into some kind of citizen journalists. I can't think of anyone who did not capture something and post it somewhere online, YouTube, Facebook, you know, a sentence, I saw this, you know, a picture that they took, uh, a video that they taped. Uh, this, however, evolved into more structured networks of journalists and as the conflict evolved we started to see the emergence of citizen journalist networks like Sham News and Ugarit. Uh, they have <coughs> reporters all over Syria. Now they have their own satellite internet uh, connection because you know 60% of the country is disconnected. Uh, they, they had some training at some stage, both of them, these are just two examples, there are several. They are registered in countries outside Syria as NGOs and they get a lot of, or I mean reasonable, funding and support from governments and international uh, NGOs. The question is to what extent you can trust and rely on the information and the news provided by these networks. It's a question, I can't really answer it myself. However, the fact there are, that there are a number of them, so you have diversity of sources, probably you can go and fit for yourself, you know, check. You know, if you hear something, if you read something, you can, you know, just double check if it's you know, on the other network, you know. And one of them use Facebook as their main outlet. They have websites and they have other platforms, but I mean their main presence is on Facebook. So very often they post something, and then eyewitnesses from the area started to comment. This is another layer of, you know, vetting this information. No, that's what, you know, it wasn't like this. I saw that and it's this. And very often they go back and they say, okay, now they, they refine their news. So I think to some extent we can trust uh, them. <coughs> yeah. uh, the Syrian regime uh, used the internet as a weapon from day one. In fact, it's always used it even before the revolution. Uh, the internet in Syria was uh, fully controlled by the regime, censored, monitored, you know. People had, you know, people started to get in trouble because they, they were using the internet. So people were being arrested, targeted uh, by the regime. Then the Syrian Electronic Army emerged as, you know, they claimed to be an independent group, but everyone knows that they're funded and sponsored by the regime or by people who are tied with the regime. And they started to launch regular attacks on activists and opposition figures on the internet, targeting them with malware to steal their credentials and hack into their accounts. Then 
know about their networks and, and, and what they're doing. Um, they started to attack their social media accounts and, and presence. This, so the, the, the other part of the conflict, which is like the position, if you want to uh, use that uh, term, at the beginning, well, what they could do is just to try to use things like UltraServe, which is a VPN, just to circumvent uh, the uh, censorship. But then later on, they moved and they uh, became on the offensive, and hacking groups from the other side started to emerge, and they started to target the social media and online presence of the regime and its allies. So, uh, the red picture on uh, the top right is the Chinese army. Sorry, it's Syrian. It's got the Chinese army on Facebook. There is one on uh, um, uh, YouTube as well. And what they do is they identify Facebook pages and YouTube channels that belong to the regime and its supporters, and they attack them and they get them removed. They use. It's very easy. They use the uh, terms of use of these companies. So anything that violates a users, the users' agreement of Facebook and, or YouTube can be removed if it's reported to the company. So, so we're getting an obvious question, but what's preventing the Syrian Electronic Army right now from pulling to China and blocking Facebook and Twitter Facebook, Facebook and YouTube were blocked in Syria up to January 2011. Then the regime unblocked them. I don't know exactly why, but I think the regime needs these platforms as well. Because this is a very good way to engage with you know, your audience. Okay? That's number one. Number two, it's a good place to find you know, activists. Who, you know, who are not careful enough, who are not careful enough. So, I think this is why. But I mean, they were not in Syria, but they were unplugged later. Um, uh, at SACNIF, how do we respond to, to this? We monitor the internet situation in Syria. That map, we produce this uh, map on a weekly basis, uh, and it shows the state of the internet. Red is disconnected, orange is, you know, there's barely an internet, and so on. <coughs> so that's something that we do. We also use Ushahidi as a platform to, basically we crowdsource information about infrastructure <coughs> in different parts of Syria, and we push it through Facebook, Twitter, and Ushahidi as well to the public so they know, you know what the situation is. Um, we have two circumvention tools. We have the Siphon 3, it's a VPN, uh, there is a VPN too. We deploy this to Syrians to help them protect themselves while they're using the internet. <laughs> it's a virtual private network. Basically, it you know it hides you on the internet. So when you connect from Damascus and someone is looking at that connection, they think that you're from California or uh, Manchester or something. It, it's this. Uh, we also have a watch list where we receive. Uh, questions from uh, Syrians regarding their digital security, and we respond to, to this as well. Um, in this information war, social media has been very, very vital for both parties. Um, social, social media has been used to mobilize Syrians to participate in the uprising, you know, demonstrations. Uh, civil society groups use uh, uh, social media and the internet to promote and you know export what they're doing. These pictures are uh, quite recent from the north, um, showing you know civil society groups trying to do something <coughs> in a very very dark situation that is a little more uh, optimistic. However, there's a bad side to this. There's a lot of incitement that is taking place on social media. Hate speech. This is a Syrian army general who was killed by the rebels and his picture was posted with, you know, like sentences of, you know, celebrating his death. These are pictures of um, uh, the, the top left um, 
uh, picture is uh, from uh, the city of Daraya when the Syrian army went and killed 450 in two hours. And this shows um, uh, when they were uh, being buried in a mass uh, grave because uh, of the security situation, basically. Um, I tend to think that, you know, the fact that these pictures and photos and images and videos are available online and, and accessible uh, uh, by everyone, you know, there's a risk associated with this. I mean, you know, families of these victims can go all the time and, and look at them. And the, you know, the reaction that, you know, this might generate, you know, you can't really protect it. So, Evidence of, sorry about the graphic uh, pictures. Uh, on the 3rd of May 2013, uh, pro militia walked into the village of Al Baida on, on the Syrian uh, coast of the Mediterranean and they massacred about 100 uh, uh, people, including mainly women and, and children. So uh, there are no videos of the massacres, but I mean a lot of pictures were posted online later on showing what, what happened. Uh, within 24 hours, activists posted a video of someone called Ali Kayali. He's in the picture there, there is a red arrow pointing uh, uh, to him. Addressing an, 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 an audience in uh, the city of Latakia and discussing you know, the necessity to cleanse Banyans. So that was the first signal, oh, it could be him who went there, or his militia. In fact, there is enough evidence now on YouTube and, and, and on social media that suggests that it was him and his militia who committed that uh, uh, crime. So within another 24 hours, uh, I don't know who, but I mean people online just started digging and they provide the guy in a way that, you know, the CIA wouldn't probably be able to. Videos, pictures of him, he, uh, he turned out to be uh, a, a Turkish of uh, Arab origin from uh, uh, the south. He had a political party, he was associated with the uh, uh, PKK, Apologia, and the Syrian intelligence uh, uh, services, and uh, a brother of the late uh, uh, Assad, I mean, and other videos of him, you know, in uniform, fighting in, in several areas. So, you know, the amount of data and material and information that can be uh, found online is absolutely incredible. Now, sorry, uh, there's a question to, I mean, do we really need this data or this material to be available to everyone? I mean, you quite always ask the question about, you know, whether it's going to incite more hatred and more violence because everyone can go anytime and, and see it. Now, there's another question. This material is available on YouTube, so it can be removed at any time. Someone, I think, needs to go there and download it, keep it somewhere safe because I, I, I can't speak to the legal aspects of this. I'm not a lawyer, but I think it's fair and it needs to be kept because it's some form of evidence. Our second case study relates to the Kurdish community in northern Syria uh, and their presence uh, online and the remarkable amount of information we're able to gain and insight we're able to gain about this community. Um, this will be a good profile of how we use social media to actually conduct um, extensive research. Uh, to begin with, we were working for a client uh, doing general media, media monitoring, social media monitoring of the Syrian conflict. Um, and during that process, we were able to identify and in a way that I will explain in a moment uh, different communities online and actually set up uh, effectively collection efforts around those communities. Um, the three primary communities we had located were a um, militant community, a pro-regime a pro community, a social media community in support of the Assad regime, and an activist community. Um, in the process of that, we looked at the users themselves, the content they were propagating, and one of the products we were providing was a word frequency table. Um, word frequency tables just count up the number of times that a particular word is used in a particular group of text. Um, one of the things we found striking about the pro-regime, if we want to call it that, community for a period of time is about this span of about a week. We started finding an incredible amount of information about Kurds, uh, coming through the word frequency tables. 
Um, among other things, you can see uh, Kurdistan, Turkish terrorist, which is a very, of course, Kurds make that characterization quite frequently, uh, Kurdish, and then finally you'll see to the right there, Twitter Kurds. Um, this led us then, of course, to start investigating it more, uh, more depth. Um, also, just commit to memory, JSMN, those four letters. So what we came to discover was, through network analysis, the Kurdish community rapidly became an independent community within the Syrian context. Um, they had been embedded within the pro-regime community for a very specific reason, because Turkey at that time, uh, and this was in mid-January, Turkey at that time was being quite belligerent and, and being quite forward in the conflict. The pro-regime community was obviously not a fan of the Turks, uh, neither were the Kurds. So it was, a, it was a relationship of convenience to a certain degree that the pro-regime community was retweeting, in this case, uh, Kurdish content that was against the FSA. Um, this arose from a conflict that was occurring on the northern border um, in the, the Kurdish portion of Syria uh, in which the Free Syrian Army had moved into this section uh, and was contesting the, effectively the independence or the claimed independence of the Kurdish community in northern Syria. Um, and as such, they were producing an enormous amount of content. So I'd like to walk you through how we do social network analysis. And this is a good example because it will show um, the Kurdish community being detected. So what you're seeing here is a map, uh, a map of all of the social media, specifically the Twitter communications within Syria for a 24-hour period. Um, there are about, it's a bunch of links and nodes, a bunch of circles and lines. There are approximately a quarter million uh, nodes, so a quarter million users, and about uh, 360,000 uh, communications, so about a quarter, uh, yeah, third of a million. So effectively what social network analysis does, among other things, it assesses the uh, relationship between users and detects the intensity of communications and then maps those communications over time. Then we can apply statistical algorithms to them to then visualize the, those interactions to develop uh, relationships and understanding of relationships between users and within networks. So this is the Kurdish network. Uh, we visualize it in a particular way to draw out some of the key players and then as soon as visualization finishes, you can then zoom in and look at specific users and the other individuals that they relate to. Uh, these users have been sized on the basis of their prominence within the community and their connectedness. Um, this allows us to then tap into these users and get a sense of who they are. Yes? Wasn't the transformation in the image changing? Without getting way into the weeds, it's basically it's, it's what's called a force directed graph. Um, so it moves nodes in relation to one another um, to get an indication of prominence. It moves certain nodes that are less prominent to the outside and uh, brings into proximity those individuals uh, who are interacting the most closely. Yes, yeah, the actual the animation in this instance is not temporal, it's, it's force directed, so it's actually moving based on the, the dynamics of the network, it's readjusting that. And we can, that can be done in a bunch of different ways. This particular visualization is what's called force directed, so it's, it's meant to sort of draw out the intensity of interaction. So this node in the center, mm -hmm. Very right. Um, the nodes at the center, and again, again, without getting into the weeds, um, we do a lot of network dynamics. It's important to understand that social network analysis is a principle, is a, a discipline that goes back to the 1950s. It was developed by some Hungarians, actually, uh, Erders and Rinyan, um, and it's a, basically a way to visualize interactions between human beings. So, of course, it maps really, really well to social media, um, and that's how we leverage it uh, for our purposes. So, those nodes in the middle um, are the pillars of the network, if you will. Um, some networks are more durable and resilient than others, and so when central nodes are taken out, they hold up better or worse. Uh, in this case, it's a very, very broad, broad-based network in a lot of ways. There's a lot of, um, relatively, I mean, by a lot, I mean maybe more than three or four, there are a lot of very, very large nodes um, in the sense that those then create a certain resilience to the network. Is there a question? Uh, my ignorance here, uh, all things technological, um, so that, that bright star on the next guy, uh, so to speak, is a guy who's getting a lot of followers <coughs> for his uh, online work. Right, so all of those nodes, the, the remarkable thing about social networks is that they tend to rec they tend to represent real life. So people of a feather flock together. Um, Kurds in social media flock together. 
So these, each of these dots, and there's probably about 30,000 of them, is an account, an individual account. The larger ones, the more prominent accounts. This is based on interaction rather than follows as well. Again, it's a technical thing, but following someone does not really indicate much of an affiliation with them. Communicating with them uh, communicates quite a lot. Um, so each of those sort of dots is an individual, uh, or at least an individual account. Sometimes people use more than one account. Can we see this action live, or there's a delay between when you get all of that stuff and... Uh, assuming that you have effective access to the stream of data, it can be done live, yeah, absolutely. The tools we use can be effectively plugged in to particular uh, social media, and that information can be visualized live. So one of the advantages of being able to then track this community and detect this community is that you can then follow and pay attention to the content that they're, that they're um, talking about. Um, for our purposes, our client is really wanting to understand how the conflict was uh, unfolding in social media and what insight social media could provide about the conflict. And in this, pa this case, it was an incredibly, incredibly rich source of information on the dynamics of the Kurdish, con the Kurdish political group within Syria. I won't get into the details of the sort of Kurdish politics in northern Syria. Uh, we can certainly get into that in the question period. Um, two of the interesting things that we found through this network um, were the rise of female militancy within the Kurdish uh, communities in northern Syria. Um, to a much greater degree, and I think Anwar probably would echo this, to a much, much greater degree than any of the other militant groups, the Kurds tend to um, have entire female battalions. I think at last count, probably six or eight female battalions. Um, to a certain degree, I think there is a, a maybe inflated because they take quite a lot of pride in that, so they may be using it as a propaganda tool, but we know perspective that there's quite a number of female militants. So that's one of the very, very interesting dynamics that we've uncovered through social media. Um, the other one was much more focused on social media itself, and that was eccentric connections. You can find amazing, odd things that happen through social media. JSMM, the four letters that I mentioned. On the bottom left, that's a group of gentlemen in Pakistan, and that they are members of the Jaish Sin Mutahid al which is a Sindhist separatist group in Pakistan. Um, they're marching uh, in, uh, effectively in uh, collaboration, in, in support of the Kurdish movement in northern Syria. Um, this connection was drawn very much out of social media. You could see it happen, you could see the relationship building, and then all of a sudden on the ground we started to see actual <coughs> social action right, um, through a, a social media relationship. Uh, in, the, in the top left there's a, a Help Catalonia article. Uh, the Kurds are not alone, so again we're seeing these interesting uh, relationships between ethnic minority groups that are emerging very much through social media. Um, it provides a remarkable lens for us, it provides a remarkable lens for our clients. And again, to emphasize, our clients are more often than not approaching this from a diplomatic perspective. They want to help to understand how they can engage diplomatically, and specifically uh, through direct diplomacy, which is a concept that's developing in the diplomatic community. It's pretty new. Canada is actually quite, quite on the forefront of it, and we're proud to know that we're also helping them to be at the forefront of digital diplomacy and direct diplomacy. Um, but it's effectively in the absence of traditional media and traditional diplomacy, what do you do as a state? Uh, and the answer is you get involved. You try and, you try and use social media uh, to get involved. So in this case, it provided an excellent avenue for them to get involved with the Kurdish community. Um, so that's that. I'm going to let now Anwar talk about um, the blackout situation in Syria and how that's unfolding. Arabia. 
that became a kind of, you know, a, a source of danger and, and threat to the regime. So they decided, okay, let's just shut down the internet on Friday so people, you know, don't do this. Uh, so the idea was to silence uh, the opposition. Also, before the Syrian army invaded uh, certain areas, they would black out these areas completely, shut down all forms of telecommunication, sell landlines, internet, everything, also to cover for the operations. So at the beginning and in the first year of the conflict, probably in the first year and a half, it's not as true anymore. Uh, Losing internet connectivity in one area was an early signal of warning that you know something major was going to happen. I witnessed some of this, this myself in, in some areas. How do we uh, respond to this as a sector? We have a major project on, on digital security and cyber security then. On Syria. Part of it is we monitor the internet and internet traffic. And we can know, I can't really say in advance, but I mean, we, we can, you know, we see when the internet is shut down. It doesn't happen, you know, like in, in a split of a second, it happens a bit, you know, gradually. So we start to see that the traffic is, you know, going down, and then we can issue warnings that the internet is going down in Syria. So other players need to keep an eye on you know, what is happening because this might be a sign of something major. Um, when, the internet, uh, when, when the internet goes down in Syria, uh, we, we as Sectiv don't provide any uh, uh, support, but I mean others do. Uh, a lot of uh, other actors uh, provide dial-up uh, internet alternatives, so people from Syria can dial a number in the Netherlands or you know somewhere in Europe, and they can get internet access through their uh, landline. Uh, Twitter provided a service, speak to tweet, so basically people could just uh, make a phone call to a certain number outside of Syria, leave a message, and then it appears on on Twitter on their Twitter account. So that was. Uh, something important because I mean, communication is power, you need communication in a war zone because you know, your survival depends on it, you know, your life depends on it. Um, as, as the conflict progressed and, and uh, some parts of the country fell out of the control of the regime, people started to gain more, to become more independent of the uh, <coughs> government internet infrastructure. Uh, the internet continues to be uh, a very vital tool for everyone in Syria, mainly activists who try to uh, cover the events and share the information with the world. Uh, they don't only use it for this, I mean, you know, they, they, they use it to communicate, coordinate, organize. Um, it, it's just so vital to what they do that they cannot live without it. Uh, and in recent months, alternatives started to, to emerge, and basically along the borders with Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, and, and Lebanon to a lesser extent, people became aware that you know, they could pick up 3G signal from these countries, and they started to use internet from neighboring countries. Also, uh, satellite internet has become another way uh, to keep, uh, you know, to, to stay connected. So now in, in northern Syria, particularly where the regime is no longer in uh, control, uh, a lot of uh, groups, militant groups and, and civil society groups, uh, you know, have acquired their own satellite internet connections. So even when the uh, blackout happened on May 11th, you know, the country was disconnected because uh, the government, you know, the, the official, infrastructure um, was down, we still saw a lot of news coming from many areas in Syria because, you know, people had satellite internet. Um, uh, now in, in, uh, in Idlib, which is northeast, and in Raqqa, which is now uh, 
completely under the control of uh, Rebel and has its own governance structure. It has a local administrative council that is managing things in, in, in the governorate. We're starting to see internet cafes emerging, uh, you know, small businesses uh, based on satellite uh, internet providing the service to the public. Uh, we are also aware of some uh, um, initiatives uh, trying to support uh, civil society groups to have their own inter uh, like free uh, internet cafes where they can provide internet access to uh, the public as well. Uh, just to uh, wrap up, I mean, if we uh, if we accept the notion that communication saves lives, I think you know what we do is very, very relative. If we accept the notion also that, you know, material available on, or on, on, that, you know, becomes available online, could be used as early warning for, you know, of uh, genocide or mass atrocities, I think the Syria case demonstrates this very, very well. The question is why, you know, not much has been done about this. I mean, the, you know, in the case of uh, Burma, I mean, you know, there is you know, a clear lack of evidence. In the case of Syria, just go on YouTube now, type Syria, and you'll find thousands of videos, you know, depicting mass atrocities in, in Syria. It's all there, I think it just needs to be uh, used. So our final case study is a, so another example of social network analysis in action. Um, one of the most important things to understand uh, about our work, I think, and Anwar and I have been reflecting on this a lot, is that we're focusing in this presentation a lot on conflict dynamics, focusing a lot on killing and death. Um, and that is tremendously unfortunate um, because there's so much else going on in the conflict. But in this stage of the conflict, that's the most prominent by far um, aspect of the conflict. Um, earlier in the conflict, digital security and this sort of thing was, played a much more prominent role. Now it plays a role in support of keeping people safe uh, in a much more physical way. So it's even more relevant, but it's probably less prominent, if that makes sense. Um, one of the projects that we did, uh, again with the client, was monitoring militant groups in Syria and monitoring how they interact with one another. And we discovered some really remarkable things. This is a, this is a graph of the militant community in Syria. They're very, very media heavy, which is an interesting thing to know, and I'll come back to that. Um, they love YouTube, the militant community posts things on YouTube uh, at a maddening pace, um, and it's a very, very active network. One of the things we noticed about this network, uh, very, very early in the project, was that there was an account in the middle of it um, called Yadadimo. Uh, it was a Twitter account. Um, it's actually, you can see there's a little pink arrow in the center. It's not the easiest thing to see. But it was very, very central in the network and very prominent. Um, Yadadimo was the Twitter account of a charity, uh, which confused us it's <laughs> somewhat. So we wanted to, to then investigate why they, what they were doing there. Effectively, what, what, what turned out to be the case is, again, it was a relationship of convenience. The militant communities were um, circulating the content of this charity. Um, and again, it's one of these things where you read you know, the old joke that you can, you can pick your friends, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your family. Um, in this case, you can't pick who retweets you to a certain degree. And um, to a large degree, the, the, uh, the militant community was their family. The militant community was the ones that were retweeting them. Um, there ended up being some fairly concerning affiliations within that because, as you may know, the, the militant community in Syria spans a very wide ideological spectrum and they have some of their ideological affiliations um, over time developed to be quite, um, quite radical. Um, but what was interesting is we were able to then discover Syri the Syrian Relief Authority, which was this charity, how they use the social, how they use social media in concert with, with militant groups. Um, again, ideology aside, it was a hopeful sign that that these two groups were working together on some level. Um, and it led us, and sort of cued us to the presence of this evolution in how militants were acting in the, in the conflict. That militants weren't just being militant, they were actually doing other things. Uh, and that led us, through our client, directed by our client, to investigate further. Um, one of the investigations that we conducted was on Lib al uh, which is a brigade in the north of Syria. We discovered some pretty remarkable things. Um, actually, Anwar was at the front of this particular investigation. Oh. 
So, Liwa Al-Tawki was a very effective fighting force. They, in recent days, uh, as you may have heard the news off of this area, this area um, west of Homs was under severe Hezbollah attack. So Liwa Al-Tawki actually moved their forces into Al-Qusayr. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't think that it, it helped in the long run. Um, but it, several months ago, Liwa Al-Tawki was well entrenched in Aleppo uh, and in the northern areas. And we started finding all sorts of remarkable evidence that they, instead of focusing on winning new territory, were focusing on developing administrative capacity. So you can see here in the bottom right, they were training um, police force in, in Aleppo. Um, in the upper right, they were delivering aid and pillows and food to local residents. Uh, in the upper left, this is quite interesting, uh, they walked out and was fumigating the streets of Aleppo. Uh, in Aleppo, there is what they call the Aleppo fly, and it, if it bites you, you get a very severe infection. It's very, very unpleasant. Uh, in the absence of the regime, no one was fumigating for this fly. So, Liwa al stepped in. Um, it was an indication of the necessity in this conflict uh, that somebody do something. Uh, and particularly in areas that are not held by the regime, um, militant groups are often the most capable, both on a physical sense, but also from a virtual sense. So, um, in another area, Harb City in the north, uh, the local coordination committee there, their content, particularly video content, was being posted and promoted by the local battalion. Uh, we think, primarily, because the local coordination committees tend to be rather old and age, uh, long in tooth, and not that great with technology. Um, so their techno the technological presence is not especially good, but the militant groups tend to be young and technologically savvy, so they were actually helping. So it was a synergistic relationship that was occurring between the two of them. Um, that online relationship was an indicative of an offline relationship that we would assess to be quite actually, actually quite hopeful. Uh, in terms of how administration is developing. Uh, it's often a difficult concept and a difficult situation to accept, I would say, from a sort of a atrocity prevention perspective, that militants um, in a conflict can actually be a proactive and helpful force. Um, but in most areas of northern Syria, we would say that that is the case. Um, certainly there are exceptions to that. So we're just about out of time. Um, I wanted to kind of circle back to what effectively are the lessons learned for SECDEV, but also I think for the world at large about the Syria conflict as it relates to technology. Um, and the first one is that Syria is the new normal, Syria is the new ordinary. Uh, there was a moment in which we said, wow, it is extraordinary what's happening in Syria. Um, but as the conflict has dragged on, um, the relationship between the individuals on the ground and technology is becoming the new ordinary. It's a harbinger of things to come, as we said. Um, there's no reason to think anything otherwise. Um, and the distinction between online and offline, both as a, as a question of security, but also I think as a question of, I want to call it an existential question, um, that dichotomy is fading rapidly. Um, as we know, as Westerners who are often plugged into our phones, you have seen me scurrying around all weekend on my phone, um, that dichotomy is probably a lot less present than it should be sometimes. Um, in a conflict situation, it, it is almost non-existent for large sections of the population. Um, they don't have separate lives, online and offline. Their vulnerability in either world is very, very real. Uh, and that's critically important for the future. Um, another important point is that ethics matter in this uh, enormously. This is something that Anwar and I have discussed at length as well. Um, it's understandable to be quite ticklish when the word intelligence comes out. It's quite understandable to be quite um, uncomfortable, perhaps, when you see thousands and thousands of people being networked on a screen. Um, the ethics behind that are not easy, they're not straightforward, but the important thing to know is that they have to evolve in real time. We can't stop um, helping <laughs> with the tools that we have available to us, Syrians, to stay safe. Uh, and so, without implying their ethical, sort of, there's an, I, I, I feel strongly there's no ethical issues with the work we do, but certainly there are ethical uncertainties in understanding the implications. As Anwar said, one of the, the ones we struggle with is the presence of violence online may lead to more violence offline. That while it's important to have that um, as evidence for accountability, it may also lead to more incitement of violence and more atrocities, um, which I think is a, is a, is a pressing and um, disturbing question on some, on some level. Uh, and then finally, I think in, in light of that, um, this is about saving lives. and, and it's easy to dismiss the digital space as being what we understand it to be in the West most of the time, which is people posting pictures of cats. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, or their dinner, exactly. That used to be the big thing as well. Um, and yet, even that, that's not even true, really, in the West as much as we think. Social media is often dismissed, but, you know, I'll, this is a bit close to home, but you may have seen in the news over the last several days that there are several large fires in Colorado. I grew up in Colorado. My grandmother's home was about to be burned down, so I'm following social media to find out what's happening in my hometown. Um, that happens here just as much as it happens there. Um, there, there's tremendous consequence um, for the community at large. So it's important, against the backdrop of the complexity of this, to recognize that it's about saving lives. Um, at the risk of sounding overly emotional as a conclusion, I will leave it there, and we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Something. I mean, we provide uh, digital safety tools to Syrians, uh, two VPNs uh, that we deploy and they're used by ten, like thousands and, and, and thousands of Syrians. We never collect anyone's data. We don't know who's using them. We know that we know the number. We, we only have aggregate, aggregated information, and that's all. Even when we map these to their communities, I mean, we do not reveal like names of accounts. You know, we respect their privacy. Although, I mean, the, the information on, on Twitter is publicly available. I mean, we respect that, you know, these people might not be willing to share, you know, their names and information. So, thank you for a very enlightening presentation, gentlemen. And uh, I really just have a single question and comment. Uh, it sounds to me as if you are deploying a meaning for incitement that is at enormous distance and variance from the international criminal definition of incitement and the use of incitement by academics in the literature on hate propaganda and incitement. You're suggesting that post that the fact that the videos that are posted Posted, that show atrocities is a form and a body could constitute, or often does constitute, a potential incitement to further retribution and other atrocities. Uh, that's a possibility. But the way scholars and practitioners use the term incitement normally is not to say if you post a picture of a mass grave, that's incitement. But rather, if you had, for example, a uh, tweet or a Facebook page which insisted that all Alawite people were devils who are bound to rape, pillage, and murder, uh, that would constitute incitement because it's not linked to anything besides the demonization of the group by attributing things to it. Uh, if you had a video that showed a militia from any particular community and said, these people who are committing this atrocity come from this group, I'd rather doubt that would be uh, considered incitement. That would be a factual report on people from a group doing that. So why are you so prone to each time referring to those uh, pictures and videos that show mass atrocities and their consequences as incitement. Uh, are you aware that you're not using the legal or the scholarly definition? Sure. I think, yeah, to use words lightly is not a thing that I like to do. Um, but the, the distinction there is that I don't think we're applying there to motive behind it. I don't think anyone, we're suggesting that they're posting these necessarily or likely because they're trying to incite violence. It's more the concern that we have, and it's not, so that's one. Second point is that I don't think either of us would suggest that those things should not be posted. It's just that there's an ethical challenge to us and a, that, that it may be, do, it may be harm, creating harm in, as well as creating good. That there may be harm there. Um, so you're right in saying that incitement is maybe not the best word, but as, as ammunition for incitement, um, certainly the case. And I would say that there is more harmful if you don't use. Absolutely, and, and that's tomatoes. yeah. And it, but it's, it's sort of the, the tomatoes and the salad sort of question is um, where's the wisdom? Where's the wisdom in this, and how does this work? Um, that's very relevant knowledge, um, but it's 
isn't, isn't necessarily wise. Um, it's necessary for us to have it, I absolutely agree, but it does kind of keep us awake at night that maybe this is making things worse sometimes. Um, so it's, I, effectively, I would say ammunition for incitement, though I would say we do have plenty of incitement as well. There's lots of videos of little children singing about that to the Alawites and things like this that, that are very painful, and lots of videos of, of people doing the same thing and de uh, depicting Sunnis uh, in a very, very severe way as well, in a, in a very horrible, insightful hate speech sort of way. I just add uh, something. Um, it's not only posting the video. I think posting the video is is good. You know, it's you know it's fair for everyone to see and be aware of it. And the way it's employed by others later. You know, on YouTube you just need to come and say, look at what the dirty Alawites are doing to us. Let's go and wipe them off. Look at what the dirty Sunnis are doing. Or, uh, not necessarily sectarian terms, but I mean the dirty traitors. You know, like everyone who's against us in Syria are doing. Hey, President, why don't you send the army to, to wipe them off completely and get rid of them for us so we can live in peace? You know, you see these things happening. I mean, it, so they're being used in, 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 in different ways. So there is a risk there. And, you know, we raise a question, and, and, and that's all. Do you see um, any uses of um, cell SMS messaging counter hate speech with more moderate. So in other words, out of 2007, 2008, we saw hate speech coming out of Kenya, for example, and we saw the CEO of Safaricom suggesting the usage of actually insisting on the usage of the cell company to introduce more moderate speech. Do you see, you know, do you see the opposite side of that? The telephone network is monitored in Syria. I don't think anyone uses uh, SMS for any political or uh, like conflict purposes, uh, because it's very tightly monitored by the regime. In fact, it, it's filtered. In the early days, when we sent messages saying, "Okay, there is a demonstration," you know, and that's what let's go. You know, the other party would get like you know wouldn't get the message. They would get like you know uh, something saying the message is broken or something. So these words are filtered. Uh, no one uses them. I mean, people. Developed like other ways, you will start to say there is a party, then that was filtered too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for telephone networks are very, very tightly uh, monitored in this. Hence, you need the alternative space. Okay, thank uh, Hey, I'm Andrew Jordan. I just want to ask a question that I uh, wasn't really clear on. You mentioned uh, clients, and I was wondering if you could talk briefly about what kind of clients would approach your group and what kind of evaluation that you might take as a group to determine if there's any ethical considerations or whether you should be helping them or should not be helping them. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll feel that to a degree and I'd be happy to talk about it later. I, part of it is that our, I, I think our clients are who you might expect them to be in, this, in the sense that we work with um, private organizations, um, government departments, you name it. We'd be happy to, 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 to get into it in more length elsewhere. I mean, part of it is, is that and again, this is a fine line with when you talk about intelligence. There's nothing, there's nothing covert about it, but there is the, the difference between speaking to a crowd, a room, and over a, ca you know, over a table in a cafe. Our clients are interested in engaging, in engaging to a great degree in helping Syrians quietly. Um, so particularly as, as, as it relates to direct diplomacy, you'll see certain countries, for example, like the United States, uh, a lot of their direct diplomacy is focused on a large message, very, very sort of high and broad messaging. Um, the difference I think that other countries are employing is that they are using a much more specific approach in, in what would be something closer to classic diplomacy, that they're, um, they're interested in finding people who they can talk to on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, as such, it's, it, for them, it's important to be discreet rather, rather than secret, uh, I would say. So uh, I'd be happy to, to talk about it at more length you know, on a one-to-one -one basis again as a, as a classic diplomat. Probably kind of a basic answer, but I mean, can engage with it. Um, yeah, I have a question. Fascinating presentation, guys. Uh, uh, really um, I want to ask you a, a question. I, I, I received your, your, your Syria digital flashlights, and um, a couple of months ago, um, when you sent one out, and you said that you were able to uncover uh, images, I'm not sure it was from YouTube or, or, or Facebook, but a video of a rebel group that actually had uh, a, a SAM, a short missile. And um, you were able to determine in a very limited time
time that they did that those shoulder premises originated from China, and that uh, they were not in the uh, under they weren't in the control by the Eastern Army, so they basically weren't looted from an army depot in you know, Seattle or somewhere. So I'm just wondering if you tell us more about how you were able to detect that. You know what software you used to process, or, or, or I mean, because this is all beyond the capability of just two of you. I mean, you have to have some. Some super duper uh, program that allows you to sit through this stuff. Can you give us a little bit more detail and put out that building your secrets and how you're doing Sure. Well, I mean, the super duper program is other people. I think that's the most important thing to understand because that's the internet, right? Uh, is that there's a remarkable amount of information that we can derive. I was talking to someone about a, a, a blog called Brown Moses, and that's nothing especially secret about this. It's a blog. Uh, this gentleman is a weapons expert. Um, well, Actually, he's not a weapons expert. He's by, by his own doing. He's, he's becoming one. Um, I think he's probably like a software engineer on the uh, as, as a full-time job, but he's, he's developed an interest and in a focus on that. Um, so that's one input. Uh, we also sort of use uh, sort of expert consultants, that sort of thing, to help us develop that, that knowledge. We, I don't think either Anwar or I are, are weapons experts either, um, but we know weapons experts, and we know weapons experts on the internet, for example. So that's part of what helped us to identify the SAMs. Um, you know, we do social media monitoring, so that helps us to get the initial evidence um, of particular videos. Part of it is that, again, because of the approach that we take to social media, um, prominent content rises to the top. So we can we can take advantage of that. We can also, and we're doing a lot of quite a lot of research right now on um, using social media for weak signals. Um, in this particular case, the SAM footage um, we caught it early, uh, but it was rising in prominence very very rapidly. Um, in other issues, it may be something that hits the internet but doesn't take off, for example. And so we're, we're developing strategies in terms of how to find less prominent content, if you want to put it that way. I think it's probably the best way. But the, the advantage is, is that we, because we, we were able to parse apart communities, we know where to look very, very quickly. Um, the, the, if you'll humor me for a moment, the, the, the metaphor that I use to explain social network analysis a lot of the time is the difference between um, fishing and oceanography. So, if, if you're uh, looking for information on the internet, your first instinct is to go straight to Google. Uh, and you say, you know, this, 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 and this. Um, you're effectively you're building a little fishing net. And Google throws it into the, to the ocean, pulls out exactly what you think you want. Um, but the difficulty is that it's pulling it out of its context. Particularly when you're searching social media, if you search for you know, uh, China and Sam and Syria, it's going to find all that stuff and it's going to set it aside for you and you're going to look at it. The advantage of social network analysis is that we don't use a net, we just jump right in. Um, we're actually looking at the, the, the network as it exists. Um, so we can see the relationships that exist, we can see who's prominent, we can see where um, uh, information and communication are focused, and so that we can zero in very, very quickly um, in that sense. We have a much higher level of situational awareness, so we can find information very, very fast. Um, yeah, a fascinating topic uh, and a great presentation. Um, mine is less of a, a, a comment or even less a challenge than it is simple, a simple uh, search for clarity. Uh, you talked very briefly about the history of, of SEPDEF and, and I, I think my question resonates a little bit with, with uh, Jordan's. I'm interested in uh, the history of, of your company, how he does, you guys know, uh, came to put this together. Uh, and if you could, if you could uh, speak a little bit about uh, the, the uh, other kinds of work that you've been doing in addition to Siri, if you have, how long you've been doing this, and uh, maybe give us a minute or so about. Uh, I don't even really know how to put this because I don't know how to. I don't know how to qualify your your business if it is a business. Uh, if it is, uh, I am interested in, uh, as well in that question of of, of accountability. Yep. Uh, and if you're a private enterprise, who are you accountable? To, and uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, how do you uh, solicit either either clients or um, someone interested in taking you guys on, and how you make that uh, qualitative uh, assessment as to uh, dare I say whose uh, allegiance you want to to decide with? If I can put it that way. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I can tell you a bit about the company. I mean, Effectively, SecDev, the best way to characterize SecDev is by calling it an operational consultancy. I think it's probably the best term I've heard for it. So we provide a lot of advice, um, but we also implement. So we actually do things. We don't just you know, write things. Um, we do both. Uh, SecDev itself is composed both of analysts like us uh, and 
recycling developers, as I said. Um, so we're creating solutions uh, very, very quickly. SecDev has always been interested and worked at the intersection of conflict and technology. Um, those two things. Cyber empowerment is a big area where we've worked that there's an aspect of that here, but we've also worked in other regions to, to empower individuals to be able to communicate and to, to represent themselves in, in social media space and in, in internet space. A um, big part of what we do is, is helping individuals in areas where it's the, 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 the government may be trying to, to sort of reduce their rights as digital citizens to be able to assert those rights, um, primarily through technical means, but also through helping them to understand um, what they're doing. Um, a lot of what we're moving into now is what we've started calling some sort of social media hygiene, <laughs> which is like thinking of social media as a public health risk. Um, and helping people to understand how not to reveal themselves in that sense. Um, again, you know, having cl clients is obviously the tricky bit. Arnev Manchenda is our, our business development guy. He's in the back, so you can go and assault him <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> um, yes, there's absolutely an ethics uh, aspect to it, and there's an ethical review that's in place. We have we have very very strict privacy uh, regulations when it comes to particularly with social media. One of the advantages, particularly for public organizations, is that we are a private organization producing a public good. Um, that means that there's a filter through which they can work with us. Um, they, can, they can understand our insights without us disclosing to them um, information that they really should not have. Uh, but for example, like usernames and sort of thing. Um, that's the sort of information that we do not provide um, because it is sensitive. It's not, again, it's all in the, in the public space and that's the most important thing to emphasize. This is all in the public space. Um, but it's ticklish, nevertheless. Just really quickly, if you don't mind, uh, have you been doing other work in addition to uh, what's going down in Syria? Absolutely, yeah. So the organization, to answer your question a little bit more fully, is about six years old. Um, so it's been since about 2007. Um, and has, we've worked in, let's see, uh, Latin America, uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, all the stands. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the Far East, so sort of East Asia, Thailand, that, kind of, that, that area. Um, we do have, or have had, a field office in, in Brazil, so well, so we're doing quite a bit of stuff down there. So it's, it's, it's very broad based. Um, we have the advantage of having a lot of connections around the world, so we're able to, to operate in a lot of different places. And yes, you're absolutely right, we're a private organization, so that's important. Hi guys, uh, I'm Sheldon, uh, I'm an engineer from OneCook as well. Um, so I was nodding throughout the presentation, and I appreciate it very much. I thought I'd be, I'd be able to go throughout the week without hearing VPN, but it wasn't to be. Um, I was reading your material and what really struck me was the level of technical sophistication of some of the techniques that are being used, packet sniffing, VPN, that type of thing. So I was, I was wondering if you see that technical one-upsmanship between the two sides, between government, you know, fixing a hole and then opposition exploiting it. And does the level of sophistication suggest, and have you seen this, the markings of other state actors helping with cyber training? Okay. I mean, yeah, I would say that it's, it's definitely a tip for tap. It's a, it's a challenge and response on both sides. Um, Anwar mentioned the Syrian Electronic Army. Anwar and I recently wrote an article on the Syrian Electronic Army, and um, then the Syri Syrian Electronic Army noticed <laughs> that we wrote the article, which was kind of interesting to see that happen. <laughs> so it was good. also so it was locked down. Um, but the, the, more, the, the important thing to know about the Syrian Electronic, Electronic Army is that their uh, approaches are not especially sophisticated, so it's a lot of spear fishing. Sending out emails from Nigerian princes trying to get your password. Um, relatively mundane stuff, but they have, I would say, the, the more interesting aspect rather than the technical is the political. So they are clearly um, they, they're working with people who have a very smart understanding of the Western of, of Western thinking because the, the accounts that they choose to hack, they recently hacked the Onion of all things um, and put out some all sorts of bizarre anti-Zionist stuff. Um, they hacked the AP recently, you may have heard about that, but, yeah, the Reuters. Uh, when they hacked the AP, they put out a tweet that said that that White House had been bombed and the Dow Jones dropped like 600 points in about 10 seconds. Um, so their, their technological uh, advancement and um, techniques aren't especially advanced, but their understanding of how to uh, provoke a response is quite tremendous. Um, I mean, the big player in the region is certainly Iran when it comes to technical circumvention and, and suppression. Um, I, but I wouldn't speculate about the relationship between the, the two states on that on that level. Are they using the same methods as the Iranians? 
there is evidence that Syria is getting help from Iran in you know like areas of internet uh, censorship, uh, etc. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think there is a relationship. Yeah. Hi, folks. Again, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm also curious about um, your your organizational model as, as a private enterprise, uh, and specifically whether or how you connect to some of the hacker crews and collectives um, as well as the social justice technology activists who essentially do the work that you're doing but for, for free. Um, do, you, or do you see a competition? Do you collaborate with those actors? Um, you, you, you talk about uh, uh, operating within um, uh, a free open information framework, um, but I'm not sure that I'm totally, totally getting how that's actually playing out on your end. Um, I'm just curious how you connect to that, that broader community of hackers and technology activists, and if you go and take part in, in stuff like hacker conferences and things like that. Thanks. I mean, we, we have a really extensive network of other organizations, uh, for example, in Syria. We have a whole host of organizations that we work with. Their primary focus is not technology, but they have, um, in the course of the conflict, recognized the value of it and the importance of it. So both for their own work, but also for the Syrian people. So um, organizations that their focus might be elsewhere, they might be photography activists, for example, um, but they've, they've started to implement a lot of the solutions and things that we're able to help them with um, to, to, to work in Syria. Um, Hacker Collectives is a much more delicate thing. I don't think we, we, we would do our best not to get overly involved there. I mean, one of, one of the interesting things, though, is that when you see things like the blackouts in Syria, the first people on the spot are, are, are anonymous collectives. Um, they're providing all sorts of remarkable assistance, and that's to be applauded, but in terms of collaboration, you know, that's just not a good idea. <laughs> I just want to uh, say that the genre in which you're working, there's a, there's a phrase you might want to use in the future, which I'm sure you know well, but it didn't come at all into your presentation, and that's open source information. That's what you do, only you're applying it to the new social media. So as we listen to you, and as I listen to you, speaking just for myself, uh, what I hear is the work that people like John Heidenrich wrote about back in the 90s uh, in a book that he actually has been published on genocide, advocating, I think quite correctly, for more use of open source intelligence and, and analysis. Uh, and if John was standing here, he would probably say, and now we should be doing it exactly the way you're doing it now for all sorts of new media. Uh, the whole point, though, is that there has been a degradation in open source monitoring in the other areas, in the traditional media. Now, in Syria, it's really dramatic, and as you show, there's a mounting use of Facebook, etc., at least up to a plateau that's now quite high, perhaps. Uh, in most of the world, particularly in Africa, uh, radio is still a very, very important medium of communication. Probably the most important in Africa is still radio. As uh, people have observed in the Democratic Republic of Congo, who travel there frequently, there's a, there's a radio hanging from every tree. Uh, and I wonder, and since we have a lot of software here people, software people here, um, if there could not be some more collaboration, perhaps at great saving in uh, expenditures, in using new kinds of software and text analysis, combining it with the sort of high-powered computer analysis you're using to fill the gap in the monitoring the traditional media like radio. Now, I don't know to what extent, I mean, when the Foreign Broadcast Information Service and the BBC Monitoring Service monitored, they literally had people with headphones on who, in 
real time, usually, or within 24 hours, listening to tapes or digital recordings, would translate, transcribe, transcribe, translate what they were hearing. And that would be made available within a few days of the actual broadcasts. There is a famous story about the government of Hungary trying to change sides towards uh, in 1944. And the Hungarian monitor at the BBC World Service uh, in Caversh Park at BBC Monitor had gone for tea and left no one to fill in, right? And so the announcement by the government of Hungary that it really wanted to do what Romania had already done in 1944 to change sides was missed. And the British government only found out about it when it read it in the newspapers. Okay? Um, we're, we're out to tea for a long time now. <coughs> Countries uh, in Africa that are very vital to our security and preventing mass atrocities. We are flying blind in many of those places. And the only reason that we picked up the incitement in Cote d'Ivoire was that a few local people began to report it and they saw the potential. And so the Office of Prevention of Genocide Director or Advisor was able to go and to actually do something. So I guess the best I can do, uh, in fairness to you, I can't ask you for a real answer now. You're not the strategic directors of the whole operation is to suggest that the people here who are computer engineers, Waterloo graduates, etc. Uh, uh, for those of you from the States, Waterloo is like our MIT in this area. Uh, 